Okay, so a lot of you have been highly anticipating this one. I've been getting tons of comments on previous Goosebumps monthlies where you guys are all, ooh, three more books till Cuckoo Clock of Doom, two more books till Cuckoo Clock of Doom, one more book till Doom Clock. But I didn't really get a sense of if you were all excited because it was good or because it was bonkers. Having now read it, I still don't know which one it is. It's both, but also it's bad. And also it isn't bonkers enough? I'm conflicted, but let's get into it. Our protagonist this time is Michael Webster. Everyone in town knew Michael Webster. He worked at the bank for 40 years. Um, no, Michael is 12, and he's a poor toilet boy everybody craps in. Michael's most frequent torturer is his seven-year-old sister, Tara, who is constantly pulling pranks, breaking Michael's stuff, or straight up assaulting him. This is bad, but what makes it a thousand times worse is that Michael's parents are never on his side about it. Michael is constantly blamed for Tara's misdeeds, and anytime Michael tries to get Tara to stop, his parents are all, you're the bigger brother, you need to be nicer to your sister, you little shit. I started for the bathroom to wash up. As I passed Tara, she stomped hard on my foot. Ow! I yelled. Michael! Dad barked. Stop making so much noise! But Dad, Tara stomped on my foot. It could have hurt that much, Michael. She's a lot smaller than you. My foot throbbed. I limped to the bathroom. Tara followed me. You're such a baby, she taunted. <laughs> what the fuck? Your kid cries out in pain and your first reaction as a parent is, Shut up, kid! And yes, Tara is younger and smaller than Michael, but she's not a toddler. She is well old enough to be able to hurt people. I knew one kid in elementary school who accidentally cracked three of his dad ribs by playfully jumping on him. A young kid can totally deliver the pain if they set their mind to it, and Tara clearly wants Michael dead. It gets even worse as Michael takes us through the last couple of weeks and tells us other ways Tara's made his life a living hell. A couple of days ago was his 12th birthday. His parents got him a really nice bicycle, but when they present it to him in the garage, Tara immediately jumps onto it, knocking it over and scratching it up really badly. When Michael gets upset, mom and dad are like, aren't you worried that your little sister could have gotten hurt and don't once discipline Tara for breaking Michael's gift? Later, the guests to Michael's birthday party show up, the one of note being Mona, a girl that Michael has a crush on. Tara embarrasses Michael in front of her, telling Mona about the crush, and then proceeds to open all of Michael's presents. Like, okay, that's at least a go-to-your-room offense right there, right? But no, not a word from the parents. Finally, Michael is carrying the birthday cake out to the kitchen when Tara trips him, sending him face first into the cake. The parents didn't see the tripping, so obviously Tara's not going to get blamed, but how do they react to their son falling? I sat up and wiped the brown frosting from my eyes. The first face I saw was Mona's. She was shaking with laughter. Mom leaned over and scolded me. What a mess! Michael, why don't you look where you're going? Holy shit! Your son could have hurt himself, and this has clearly put a damper on his birthday, and you decide to scold him for being clumsy in front of his friends? I mean, what the fuck is this family? Now, I've read stories from a child's perspective where they think the world is out to get them, and it's usually an exaggeration. Young people don't often have a frame of reference to put things into perspective. And I've read stories about shitty younger siblings before. As I was reading this book, my mind went back to Judy Bloom's Tale of a Fourth Grade Nothing, where the protagonist's younger brother keeps wrecking shop, but gets preferential treatment from his parents. And then, holy crap, the brother kills and eats the protagonist's pet turtle. That is an impossibly high bar for Tara to clear. She does terrorize the family cat, but never straight up murders it. But there are some caveats. The brother, in Judy Bloom's book, is only two and a half, making him far less aware of consequences of his actions, and having it make more sense why the parents are more doting and forgiving of his troublemaking. Also, the parents are not completely oblivious to how this is affecting the protagonist, and in the end gives him a dog to make up for the dead turtle. Michael has no such luck here. Tara knows exactly what she is doing. She is well aware that she is hurting her brother, and she thinks it's a riot. This is a kid who needs to be in therapy because she is on the road to being a serial killer. 
and the parents seem impossibly ignorant to what's going on, and the fact that they always take Tara's side, talking down and berating their son at every opportunity? Guys, this is an abusive household. Michael is an abused kid. There's no, it seems that way from a child's perspective thing going on. He is being verbally and mentally abused by his parents and physically abused by his sister, which the parents allow. It's honestly so extreme that it's distressing in a not fun way. Michael takes us through a couple more incidences in reverse chronological order for reasons that will become clear soon. Before his birthday, Mona came over to see the frog costume that Michael was going to wear at the school play, but Tara lets her into Michael's room while he's changing, giving his crush a good look at him in his underwear. Very embarrassing. Before that, there was a time that Tara stole the hat of a school bully and put it into Michael's bag. When the bully found it, he proceeded to beat the tar out of the poor boy. So with all that established, let's get to the book's inciting incident. One day, Michael and Tara's father comes home with an old cuckoo clock from Anthony's Antiques. Dad's been wanting this clock for years, but it's been prohibitively expensive. Just recently, Anthony dropped the price, claiming to have found a flaw in it, though what the flaw is, nobody seems to be able to detect. It's an odd clock. There's a dial on one side that shows what year it is, between 1800 and 2000. Dad then tells some stories about the clock's mysterious origins. There's something special about this clock. It comes from the Black Forest of Germany. It's supposed to be enchanted. Enchanted? I echoed. You mean magic? How? Legend has it that the man who built this clock had magical powers. He put a spell on the clock. They say if you know the secret, you can use the clock to go back in time. Dad tells the kids not to touch the clock. Tara does, and Michael gets blamed for it, naturally. So Michael decides he's going to damage the clock and frame Tara somehow. In the middle of the night, Michael sneaks into the den where the clock is, waits for the top of the hour, and when the cuckoo bird pops out, Michael grabs it and twists the head backwards. There. There's no actual evidence that this was Tara, and in fact she's probably too short to have done this easily, but those are details to be worked out in court. Michael goes to bed, happy in what he's just done. But when he wakes up, things are weird. There are decorations hanging about. Mom is baking a cake, and there's a bike in the garage. It doesn't take long for Michael to realize that it's his birthday again. He's reliving the past. Michael is just flabbergasted and doesn't really wrap his head around things in time to prevent all the bad stuff from happening. Tara still scratches up the bike, opens up Michael's presents, and trips Michael while he's carrying the cake. Michael has a few theories. Maybe this is a dream. Maybe he did go back in time because he had wished he could do his birthday over again. But when he goes to bed and wakes up the next morning, he discovers it's now a few days before his birthday. He finally realizes that this must be because he damaged the cuckoo clock. But when he goes to the den, the clock is gone. Well, of course, this is five days before Dad buys the clock. It's still at the antique store. Michael tries to tell his parents what's going on, and yeah, I'm slowly going backwards in time is a hard thing to convince anyone of, but Michael's parents seem like genuinely awful people who want to see their son dead, so even if you did convince them, they'd be like, well, better you than Tara. Michael relives the day where Mona sees him in his underwear, and we start fussing about with the book's time travel mechanics. There does seem to be some level of Final Destination can't change your fate cosmic law here. Michael can try to change events, and can even change the smaller details, but the broad strokes remain the same. He tries to lock the bedroom door so that Tara can't bring Mona in while he's changing, but he forgets that the lock is broken, and the events play out the same. When he wakes up on the day that he gets beaten up by the bully, he just kind of forgets that that's going to happen, and then Tara steals a hat, and Michael's all... Oh, right, and gets beat up. He tries one more time to convince his parents what's wrong, and they do this. Mom pushed back her chair. She walked backwards to the stove. She started dishing rice from her plate into the pot on the stove. Ya no es eram? She asked. Okay, actually, I'm going to cut this scene short because I realized it doesn't work in audio form. So they're talking and moving backwards. Mom, Dad, Tara, they're playing a prank on Michael, which they have improvised on the spot and somehow are all on board with, including the seven-year-old girl. This is some impressive cruelty. 
Like, like, this is impossible unless they rehearsed it for weeks and they're doing it on the fly. Like, okay, you, you, listener, right here, right now, say, can you pass the salt backwards? Did it take you more than a second to figure it out in your head? Then the scene is ruined and you haven't tricked your target. Now get a seven-year-old to do this without telling her that that's what you're doing. This scene is more impossible than the magic time travel clock. Michael, defeated by the cruelty, doesn't seem to be trying that hard to play with the rules of time or to get himself out of the situation. He's just along for the ride. Logistically, that's probably due to how short the book is, but I imagine the in-character reasons that Michael has been trained through abuse to just let things happen and take it. Still, it takes a while for Michael to become an active protagonist. It doesn't really kick in until Michael wakes up and realizes that he's gone back a few years now. The time travel is speeding up. Who knows how long it's going to take before we're back to before Michael was born. It's time to get up, get off our asses, and do something. Okay, so the cuckoo clock was at Anthony's Antiques for years, right? So it's probably still there. We just gotta get into the shop, see if we can manipulate the clock into making time move forward again, and cross our fingers. However, the further back Michael goes, the less agency he has, and the more difficult the task becomes. Michael finds him seven years old again, in second grade, and decides to ditch school to take the bus to the antique store. The bus driver eyed me strangely. Aren't you a little young to be riding the bus by yourself? He asked me. Mind your own business, I replied. <laughs> okay, that gave me a good laugh. Fuck off and drive! Another result of the time travel is Michael realizing how condescended and controlled younger kids are. People don't take them seriously and talk down to them until a certain age. Anyway, the antique store is closed for vacation, and Michael can't get in, so that's another wasted day. Michael keeps rolling back the years, grade school, kindergarten, preschool, and before you know it, bam, he's a baby with a poopy diaper. Tomorrow he'll either be in the womb or he'll cease to exist. Still, this is before Tara was born, so his parents aren't awful shitheads yet. And by luck, mom and dad are taking baby Michael to Anthony's Antiques in search of furniture. And there's the cuckoo clock. Baby Michael desperately waddles over, moves a chair in place, and waits for the cuckoo clock to strike noon. It does. The bird comes out with a head still twisted backwards, and Michael twists it back, and the world goes white. When Michael comes to, he finds it's his 12th birthday again. He did it. He's a few days behind, but whatever. Time is moving forward again. He isn't going to be reverted into a fetus. But, strangely, Tara is nowhere to be found. When he mentions her, his parents don't know what he's talking about. It's like she never existed. Well, let's check back with that clock and its year dial. I scan my eyes back up the dial. 1984, 1985, 1986, 1987, 1989... Wait a second, didn't I just skip a year? I checked the dates again. 1988 was missing. There was no 1988 on the dial. And 1988 was the year Tara was born. Dad, I cried, I found the flaw. Look, there's a year missing on the dial. Dad patted me on the back. Good job, son. Wow, isn't that funny? To him, it was just a funny mistake. He had no idea his daughter had never been born. I suppose there's some way to go back in time and get her. I guess I probably ought to do that. And I will. Really. One of these days. Maybe. Oh man, death by time travel. There's a way to go. Oh, now hold on a minute. Does this mean that all of 1988 just ceased to exist? Like nothing in 1988 happened? We just skipped from 1987 to 1989? That was an election year. Who became president? Does this mean that Phantom of the Opera didn't open on Broadway? Who framed Roger Rabbit didn't come out in theaters? <gasps> that was the year Adele was born. Oh no. And that was the year Shane Dawson was born. Which, uh, I actually, no more Shane Dawson? I, I can live with that. But really, a year just not existing should have massive implications to the world, like destroy the sciences append religion. It would be a Thanos snap level of reality warping. What happens to the pregnant mothers who conceived in 1987 but would have given birth in 1988? 
Oh god, that is horrifying to think about. It's worth pointing out that future prints of the book kept updating the dates on the clock. In the original 1995 printing, the missing year is 1988. In the 2003 printing, it's 1996. And in the 2015 ebook version, it's 2008. So that's the end of the book. And um, it's interesting. Honestly, I got too caught up on Michael's abusive home life to really enjoy the time travel shenanigans. And the book is kind of too caught up in it too. There are some interesting ideas in the going back in time thing. Michael is realizing how silly and out of control those earlier years were. This could easily have been a book about a 12 year old boy entering into junior high and the boy wishing he was younger again, wish he didn't have to face these upcoming adult responsibilities. Then he starts going back in time, reliving earlier grades and realizes, wait, no, having a certain level of control over my life is awesome. Being able to read harder books and being able to pick out my own clothes and have actual conversations that five-year-olds just don't have, all of that is empowering. And it's only gonna be more empowering as I get older. And the book kinda has that. But the problem is that Michael never wishes for a simpler time. So it's not a Twilight Zone ironic punishment type of story that it could have been. He does at one point wish he could do his birthday over again, but the natural result of that would be to have a Groundhog's Day type time loop. And there really wasn't enough space to talk about these ideas anyway. Goosebumps averages about 120 pages, and so much of the page real estate is taken up by the terrors of Terra. Michael's abusive family doesn't really factor into the being a younger kid actually sucked idea, because being an older kid in this family is also a total nightmare. Can somebody please put this poor boy into a foster home? I I really think Arl Stein just wanted to kill a kid in one of his books. Step one, make Tara the most evil child to grace fiction, a true Damien level shit. Even the Goosebumps wiki lists this little girl's alignment as evil. Give us a kid that even the bulliest of bullies wouldn't like. Step two, come up with a painless, bloodless, does it really count as a death? death possible. In this case, a race through time travel. I mean, it's not like she suffered, right? She was just never born. Step three, leave the door open just a little to suggest that this can be reversed. It won't be reversed. Michael is totally not saving her, but he could, you know, eventually, but he won't. So, okay, yeah, I get why people are excited for this one. It has some weird ideas and some intense characters, but it just doesn't gel together into a functional, satisfying whole. Get rid of, or at least tone down, the abusive family element, give more time to the time travel stuff, and you might have something for the win column here. But it mostly just left me exhausted. Also, we just did a time travel book. Space them out a bit, Stein. I give The Cuckoo Clock of Doom half a lemon out of 10.